So, as I said, uh, this is the introduction to Scolaris. I'm Tasha Mellens Cohen. I also have my colleague Colin Caveney with me. Hello. And we will start by introducing you to Scolaris, unsurprisingly. Uh, this is an integrated content delivery platform that uh, we have been working on for a number of years. It's evolved over various um, versions. And the concept behind Scolaris is that we can combine very many different types of content, as you'll see on this slide, into a single platform or a single site. So we are expecting to aggregate many different types of content into one place. That means not just um, searching over them, but actually making them interact effectively. Uh, you will possibly know that uh, our background of Semantico, prior to the Highwire acquisition, was very much in the uh, arts and humanities space and with a focus primarily on um, the various different flavors of book, from monographs and textbooks all the way through to major reference works and serious databases. However, we have targeted this particular demonstration of the Scolaris capabilities slightly more towards the STM field, um, as we understand that that is going to be of more interest to high-wire customers. So without further ado, I'm going to take you into a discussion of the first of our um, sites for today. This is the Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism Case Reports site, which we built a number of years ago for Bioscientifica. It's very similar to a journal site with some distinct differences, as you'll note on this slide. Uh, I'll show you the taxonomic enrichment, and I'll also show you what we mean by integrated search and browse. So, if this is willing to play nicely, there we go. So, this is the EDM case reports uh, website, and what you'll see on here is something very familiar. You've got your standard journal navigation with your cases and your editorial board. You've got your standard homepage. Um, if I choose to browse by cases, what you'll see here is a fairly extensive list of various different types of taxonomic enrichment. So you've got the demographics enrichment, clinical overview, diagnosis, and so forth. Uh, this site is fully open access, so I do encourage you to go and have a play if it is of interest. If I now choose to go from cases into a specific clinical overview, in this case pancreatic uh, cases, you'll see that I've dropped straight into search results. This is what we mean by integrated search and browse. I've got into this particular page through the browse functionality, but I can also search for pancreas and I will get the exact same user interface. This is a great example of don't make me think design where we're trying to eliminate some of the stumbling blocks that a lot of um, less experienced users are coming across on a typical uh, journal site. So if we jump into this particular case report, what you'll see up here is some of the tags that you would have spotted before in the uh, cases browse. And you'll see we have a huge amount of enrichment associated with this case. Each of these items can be used to trigger a new search and so forth. So integrated search and browse, heavy taxonomic enrichment in a very simple uh, user interface designed to make it as easy as possible for users to get through to what they want quickly and easily. Uh, you'll also see down the side here uh, something that you'll come across in many of our other sites, which is this um, multiple facet and filter option. So I can drill down very quickly um, and stack up multiple facets, multiple, uh, multiple ways of filtering my results down to only the things that I am specifically interested in. Um, slide share. So that's EDM case reports, very similar to a journal site. I'm not going to dwell on it for too long. Getting much more into the real integrated content concept is uh, a pair of sites that we have built for McGraw-Hill Education. Uh, the first of these is Access Science. It in itself is a major reference work and it has a huge amount of content. Um, of many different types, as you'll see here. So we've got the dictionaries, we've got multimedia articles and research reviews. Uh, but we also have these two 
very different content types uh, in the form of interactive projects and curriculum maps. So if I jump us into Access Science, so this is the Access Science homepage. Again, you know, you've got your um, search box, you've got your browse facilities. Um, but what you'll see up here is projects and for faculty. Just going to sign in very quickly. I thought I'd already done that. I do apologize. So if we jump into these project pieces here, um, you'll see there's a whole series of projects around the topic of engineering and materials. So I'm going to have a look at the skull candy because it makes me think of headphones. What can I say? Um, this particular project is at skill level one star, which means it's relatively straightforward. And it's designed for, generally for, for any users of the Access Science platform to experiment and do their own interactive project. So it will include a things that you need item, which usefully includes a cost indicator, um, modeling and printing instructions, and it literally talks the user through exactly how to tackle the project of creating one of their little candy skulls. There is also a, a video explaining how to do each of the steps. So this is a really great uh, teaching tool for, well, in this particular case, food science and technology, which helps uh, students really get to grips with the content in Access Science in a different way from just reading or just watching a, a video. Um, we also have the four faculty. So this is this is really cool. Um, the team at McGraw Hill have created what they call curriculum maps, which are designed. If we take this anatomy and physiology one. Uh, to provide faculty members with a very accessible, easy to use mechanism for, uh, for teaching. So in this anatomy and physiology class, we have a series of course topics. So starting with terminology and histology, going all the way through to the reproductive system at the bottom. And within each of these sections, so looking at terminology and histology here, we have a series of assets whether they are diagrams, digital images, further down you will see photographs um, and videos and, and so forth, with a description of, of what the, the asset is. So if we have a look at this particular one, you'll see that we've given the, uh, the, the faculty member direct access to an anterior view of the human body. And they don't have to sit and construct their own list of resources for a course or for a class. It's all there ready for them. Now, of course, we do expect faculty members to go and pick and choose and, and do some slightly different things, but feedback is that this is actually really a, a useful piece of kit. Um, as you'll see, it's quite a long list and it includes some nice animations. I'm now going to find out I don't have good enough webinar for the animation to, to play, but we'll see what we can do. Um, a nerve impulse is an electrical current that travels along dendrites or axons so due to ions I'm moving through voltage-gated channels in the neuron's the plasma thing. membrane. Uh, I said, won't, won't play the entire thing for you, but as you'll see from that, we have integrated video players directly into the site. So we're not popping out to YouTube or a third-party tool in order to deliver any of these animations or videos. And of course, as you would expect for um, any decent website with uh, this amount of content. We have related articles, we have related media, and actually because Access Science includes a lot of biographic information, we have related biographies are down here too. So that's Access Science. Excuse me just one second. <clears throat> so moving on, Access Engineering. Uh, not entirely dissimilar to Access Science. We have some the, the same uh, level of integrated content. We actually have some even more different content types in, in that particular platform. But we also have some nice advanced tools, um, ranging from interactive graphs through to uh, a very cool 
a piece of kit that we built uh, in 2016 called the DataViz Material Properties Platform. So, access engineering, as you'll see here. I'm going to just jump straight into DataViz, um, which probably could do with a login as well. That will teach me to get this stuff set up before I start. So, um, DataViz is a visualization tool designed to help, uh, again, faculty members, but also students and working engineers uh, explore the properties of different materials in a very visual way. So this required us to go all the way back to the basic principles of data visualization, working um, with third party subject matter experts, as well as with the McGraw-Hill team in health. And we have two options here. We can go straight into finding a property value for a single material. So if we look up Lumina, and I want to find out about the thermal conductivity of this, I will immediately get uh, a response here. So far, it's a very simple lookup. It's nice, but it's not that amazing. I also have the option to compare thermal conductivity for all the materials in the database. You'll see I've now got this lovely little um, dot plot, which has popped up. I can control what shows up in the dot plot by dragging things up and down. I can show just the things that are selected and in range. I've got a lot of control over this particular plot and what I'm seeing in it. I also have a long list of tabular data, which will explain to me an awful lot more about the materials that I'm looking at here. Again, so far, it's just a dot plot. Where it gets really interesting, ooh, sorry, where it gets very interesting, yes, that's fine, I don't want this one. That will tell me that I haven't used this for a while, I do apologize. Where it gets very interesting is where you start to look at um, more complex projects. So this is an example project set up. Why is this popping out? Ah, I am having an IP issue. I told you that was an issue with Wi-Fi. Um, I do apologize. Let's go back to Access Engineering and see what happens here. Um, sometimes just rebooting it makes a big difference. So I can, here we go. So um, this is a, a sample project which has been set up um, to demonstrate the capabilities of DataViz. And in this particular project, we are asking students to select properties which are suitable for aerospace engineering. Um, we have some blurb for each page of the project. So for example, the density. Um, we have multiple pages within this project where we can compare different properties. So in this one, we're comparing density and specific gravity. Um, we can deselect or select all materials. And if you look here, I've just deselected metals, and these are now no longer showing with a, a, a ring around them. I can reselect them and they pop back in. Um, the nice thing about this is that anything I do to one of these dot plots, so for example, let's pull this right down and say I don't want to see anything that's high density. I've immediately impacted on the gravity, the specific gravity dot plot, as well as the density plot. So this is a, a really good way to tie all of your charts together. That's data visualization, which did not go quite as smoothly as I hoped. I do apologize. Um, the next slide in here is for Colin to handle. So we're going to pass over and start looking a little bit more at some of our humanities work. Thank you. So yes, um, well, Brill. So Brill Reference Works is uh, one of a trio of sites that we have produced for Brill over the years. And let me just go into it for you. Just retrain my fingers to Windows instead of Mac. <coughs> 
So if it's, we, as you can see, there's a, a whole host of uh, titles on this particular platform, um, covering a really broad spectrum of, of uh, subject areas. So you've got biblical studies, classical studies, uh, just general history, law, um, languages and linguistics. Um, really, really broad set of content. And we've been working with Brill for, gosh, over 10 years. And um, in all that time, we've always um, been providing a website for them that, that really can handle very complex uh, multilingual data. And here's one, thankfully, we've copied earlier. <clears throat> so I haven't got a hope in hell of <laughs> typing that one out. So that is Theos. Uh, which is the, the Greek word for God or deity. And I can provide a search for that on the platform. And uh, as you can see, we come up with hits straight away. We go into that particular uh, content item. Um, it's hit highlighted. So all of this content is really uh, richly indexed. Um, in fact, you can see that it's multilingual. So this is actually German and Greek together. And within this platform, we have content from a, you know, a real spectrum of languages. So we have Hebrew, um, German, French, um, Islamic, English, a whole, a whole plethora of, uh, of languages in there. And, uh, and that's something we've been doing for, for well over 10 years. So uh, that's a, a default feature of Scholaris. So one thing to note about the, the Brill sites, um, while we can support integrated content, we have, for these particular family of sites, kept reference works, bibliographies, and primary sources uh, independent of each other. So it's a, an, another example of how Scholaris can be used. Quite. And then, really finally, is Drama Online. So this is a, this is a very nice site. This is an award-winning platform that we've produced for... It doesn't like um, oh, my screen, my... control minus. Uh, so I do apologize. I am particularly short-sighted, so my default text size is extra, extra large, which makes some of our sites look less than brilliant. <clears throat> anyway, so, uh, so this is uh, an award-winning platform. It's uh, over 2,000 uh, plays, videos, audio tracks. Uh, from content from Shakespeare through to modern day classics. And um, the great thing about this is that Bloomsbury and their publishing partners have really created a very rich data set. And, and that has enabled us to provide um, some advanced search and display features uh, within the Scholars platform. So I will do a search for hero. <clears throat> now very similar to the, uh, the STM site that Tasha was demonstrating a moment ago. We have uh, quite a rich classification and uh, taxonomy to filter by here. So you can filter by setting or a particular theme um, or a particular play type. However, there are some more interesting tools that, that we've developed specifically for this content set. So one of those is uh, Find a Monologue. So you're about to go to an audition for, for your latest and greatest play. Um, so you can use these tools to actually find a, a, find a specific monologue based upon uh, the part you wish to, um, to, to try out for. So you can choose your, your sex, how many words you wish to, uh, to be able to cater for in that. Or you can actually search for a specific play. So you may have a <clears throat> merry band of uh, actors. So Tasha and I are going to start the inaugural high wire amateur dramatics. <laughs> so I need to find a play <laughs> that has uh, one male role and one female role. I really hope you can find one. Yeah. <laughs> And there's a bunch of other places that you can filter this down. So it's, it's a really fantastic tool um, for all of the students and the uh, dramatic societies out there <clears throat> that they can plug in a number of variables and, uh, and find a 
the, you know, a correct set of plays. So I'll do a quick search here for what Tasha and I are going to act out for you. There we go. So <clears throat> April in Paris, and there you go. So I found a found a play very easily. Um, it's got one male, one female part, and uh, we could then read through that play and see if that's something we want to put on. Because we've got such rich data that enables us to perform those searches, <clears throat> uh, we can also visualize that uh, within the site. So we have this section called Play Tools, um, which is really nice, and it enables you to see uh, the actors uh, within the various acts and scene within the uh, particular play, and how many words they get to uh, to, to, to speak throughout the uh, text. Now, obviously, this is a small play for just two parts, so I will find something a bit more interesting. There we go. So, <clears throat> Cloud Nine, as you can see, has a whole variety of roles um, throughout the uh, the play and you can see by the size of the dot it's how many words or how important the part is within each scene or act and below you can see how many words are within each of those acts and scenes um, and you can actually filter that further by choosing specific parts so you can compare various parts throughout each of those acts and scenes so it's a really nice way um, when you're trying to find a play um, to, to study or to put on, to really understand the uh, the prominence of each role and, and how they interact with each other through the various scenes. And also through this rich data um, that we have, we can do something even further, which is produce play part books. So if I choose Edward here in uh, scene three, what this does is it actually just filters out all of the words um, that Edward utters throughout that scene so that instead of having to print out or carry the entire text around with me, I can just print out my part and take that away and uh, and learn that um, to my heart's content. There's also some neat things that we've done here in that we've uh, retained the page fidelity from the book. So again, when we were creating the uh, the website, some of the research that we performed with the various lecturers uh, and users of this system is that they often do have the physical book as well. And so being, being able to um, tally up what they see on the screen with what they've been reading in their textbook um, was, was really important. So every play actually has all of the words. You know, as you can see, this flows very nicely for online reading. But if I need to go back and refer to that in the textbook, um, the page is always there. And available to me. So that's just really an example of, you know, if we've got some really rich data, um, then Scolaris as a platform can visualize that in some really exciting and helpful ways. Well, that's the uh, that's that's a wrap on our on our demonstration this afternoon, this morning. Um, we'd like to thank you all for sticking with us. And as you can see, there are contact details for both Tasha and myself so there for you to... I, I have got a up. question, Ooh. so this is good. Um, what is the basic approach and workflow for collecting and providing the enriched content that makes these sites possible? Um, so I'm sure you're going to be unsurprised to find that we do ask our publishers to provide us with uh, well-structured and, uh, and uh, detailed tagging within the XML that they provide. Um, McGraw-Hill mostly use DocBook. Uh, we've got content in NLM. We've got content in Bits. We've got content in, coming to us shortly in Bits 2. Mm -hmm. uh, DocBook TI, yep. Dublin and, Core. Or even entirely bespoke um, arrangements, yep. yeah. Um, if anyone does have other comments, that apparently the, uh, the 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 Q and A questions is is working. So feel free to send me any more questions, and uh, I will take them and try to answer them. 
but certainly related to that that data piece um, you know that's one of the key parts of our project uh, is that we will uh, analyze the data that you have and be able to revise on on any uh, additional tagging or clarification on existing tagging so you get the very best out of the uh, user experience yes my team and I spend quite a lot of time doing data mapping Okay. Well, there don't appear to be more questions coming through. Oh, hang on. With the data mapping, are you looking at existing tagging? Uh, so we do a combination. We look at um, existing uh, data that is sent to us by, by each publisher. So as a rule for each publisher, we create uh, what we would call a content matrix where we link each DTD that they are that the publisher is sending us um, into the various features and functionality that that the that, that data will support um, where a publisher does not have um, particularly well marked up content we do advise on changes um, and at least partly because I'm I really love XML <laughs> I make sure to keep an eye on what is happening in the world of data schemas uh, over time. So I think that was the last one. Um, the content matrix addresses individual tag sets. So that each within the content matrix that we produce, um, I've got lots of questions coming from Susan, I'm afraid. Uh, within the content matrix that we produce, each schema is linked, uh, is, is analyzed separately and uh, mapped to the Scolaris data schema. If there's anything else, oh, Susan says thank you. I'm assuming to me. <laughs> if there's anything else anybody has, um, as, as you can see, we've got our, our email addresses on here. Please do drop us a line. We're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you, everybody. We'll speak to you all soon. Thank you. Bye.